two, two weeks people don't come. Maybe because it's summer. I feel a lot of people are out of town. Yeah. That's, that's the first time though. That's the first time. You're about to take away my two halakas a month and people don't show up. I swear, I will track down if any of these people show up to later halakas. I will look them in the face and shut the door in their face if you take away one of my halakas. It's like, this is why I never think people are like, oh, I'll just watch the live stream. I'm like, the live stream is not there so you can be lazy. It's there for people who are out of state. Yeah, I, mean, I, I have to admit that sort of you, you, you feed off the energy of the people present. Yeah. And uh, the more um, the people present, the more you, you, it, it excites you. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and I, I was, I mean, and which is, by the way, I believe it's the correct way, is that I was raised with a, 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 a fundamental idea that knowledge knowledge that is worth anything there has to be a cost paid there has to be suffering to to value knowledge knowledge that comes without suffering without paying a cost is uh, it's not worth it. Uh, it doesn't sink in deeply in your in your psyche. Uh, I mean, we of course we, we all deal with the, the the legacy of the cheapening of, of Islamic knowledge because it has been thrust to the margins of society. But I, I insist, Muslims without the Qur'an as a knowledge of the Qur'an, the study of the Qur'an, at the core of their being, uh, become, become an enigma. They become truly a, a, a meaningless category because then they, they become an ethnicity, they become an identity, they become a culture, uh, but they don't become a salat mustaqim. They, they, they're not a, 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 the bearers of a divine message. And then there's a question, okay, so what are you? Uh, why should you matter? I, you know, uh, and my, my son is a fanatic, so um, I don't know what to, I'm like scared now to take any of the halakas away because... You can. <laughs> I, I, I second him. Proudly a fanatic. <laughs> That's a good fanatic. Uh, okay, well. Sharif, it's a fan, fan, habit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so. Is there anything else outside? Do they want to start? Yeah, I did the grade. I did the grade. I did the grade. I did the grade. Okay. Now, uh, uh, you, I will take you on, on a, a journey because Surah Al-Rahman, well, remember the, the structure. It starts out with the basic fundamental truth that we are asked to attest to, to testify to, and testify in the term in terms of a conviction that we hold as as a matter of certainty. So everything that the beginning is Allah, the end is Allah, the between is Allah. So everything that unfolds in the surah unfolds from the basic premise of a Rahman, of Allah. Now, the, the core for understanding of Rahman and, and here, I'm, I'll just mention it quickly and then come back to it. 
the core for understanding Asma'u Sifat of Ar Rahman, the, the, the attributes and the names of Ar Rahman, is internalizing the Mizan. Now, and the Mizan, the, the amount of material that is written just on the concept of the Mizan in Islamic theology is mind boggling. But for us, let's just say the Mizan is a core understanding that the manifestations and self-disclosure of Allah Rahman in creation is not possible. You cannot possibly attain an understanding of Ar-Rahman without understanding that the core of Ar-Rahman is in Mizan, is, is is and the balance in terms of fairness and justice. And often students would ask, well, what is the first step for us to reflect? We understand that reflecting upon the balance for fairness and justice is a lifelong journey. No one becomes uh, uh, immune from error in assessing the balance of justice, but it's a journey. As long as it's a passion in your heart, it's an obsession in your soul, then you are with the Rahman. And the, the questions that, that would often be asked is, well, how do we start reflecting on it? And what Grace said the, in their opening, quite true, that it's the golden rule, is that in anything, you put yourself in the place of all parties concerned. You internalize, and, and I, I once wrote an article on the notion of empathy in, um, in Islamic theology, because you, you are asked to go beyond intellectual sympathy to an actual empathizing, to be able to see the fair balance in everything. And that, from that, the whole notion of wasatiyyat al-Islam, the, the, the Islam as a, as a system of moderation, as a systematic belief in the value of moderation comes from and is umbilically connected with the idea of al-Mizan, the balance, and the fundamental notion of al-Rahman. So it, it is as if all parts of a single spine you know, the, the uh, what do you call these, the um, vertebrae, vertebrae of, of a spine. It's all connected one to the other. So Rahman starts out by going over the blessings of Allah on this earth. As you could put it a different way, the self-disclosures of the divine on this earth. The way that Rahman <coughs> manifests the God self as a Rahman to you as human beings uh, in life on this earth. And many commentators have noted that here, so which of the bounties of your Lord can you deny, occurs it will occur more frequently as it talks about what happens after life on earth because on earth you are presented with a reminder of the bounties of Allah and you have a choice whether to acknowledge this as a reminder of Allah or not. But as we progress from life to this earth to the life in the hereafter, things will become so obvious in the hereafter. Your opportunity to deny it is restricted further and further. So for instance, you're not going to be able to deny the reality of hell when you are in it. So becomes a, 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 a for granted matter. It becomes an issue that is readily obvious. Or if you are in heaven, and then Allah tells you, it becomes a more obvious answer because you're in it. And what you believed in as a matter of probability on earth 
becomes a matter of certitude in the hereafter. You no longer need to speculate about it. It's right there in your face. So where we, uh, we left off is that the, the end of this first third of Surah Al-Rahman, when Allah is going through the reminders of what you were given in creation, in the here now, in, on earth, and then comes to the reality, the, 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 the critical reality of all things, that everything that you see on earth, in all its pure mutations, will but in an instant vanish and become irrelevant. And what remains is the truth behind it all, as the, 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 uh, many of the Ashab um, al-Tajalliyat, as, as, as I call them, uh, have noted that what remains is the reality, the, the, the single truth behind it all. The, the, the face of your Lord, the reality of your Lord. So, all the, the bounties that exist on earth are but manifestations, but expressions of rahmatullah, that the, the mercy of Allah. If you did not understand this mercy properly, you would become absorbed in these material bounties in, for their own sake. You, you become enamored by them. You would, you know, when we talk about how often Allah warns us not to become enamored by money and material possessions. Because in becoming enamored by them, you fail to see that they are but manifestations, or you fail to, to realize that they're but manifestations of the mercy of your Lord. You start thinking of them as an end in themselves. And the more you do, the more you drift away from Ar-Rahman, the more you drift away, and the more you drift away from the balance, from the mizan, you become an imbalanced person. But in that instant when all material possessions vanish, what remains is the pure adulterated truth. The, and, and that is the reality of Allah, the reality of Ar-Rahman. Now, uh, it, it, very interesting, um, yes. the, 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 the uh, Aslul Haqiqa, it was often described in, uh, in, in commenting on وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ that فَاللَّهُ أَصْلُ الْحَقِيقَ that in, in, in the truth of things, if you forget that the only true, unchanging, and unwavering reality is Allah, you become enamored in, in the deception, in the fog, in the, yeah, deception is, a, is, a, is the best way to say, put it, in the deception of thinking that anything else is lasting and unchanging. But in reality, all of this material existence is but in itself a mirage, but in itself a, re a, a relative and subjective manifestation of something. Now, there, there's a very interesting debate as whether, whether um, all good comes from Allah, the absence of Allah, is that the nature of evil? is the mere absence of the divine, Ar-Rahman, is what defines evil. So when, when we take uh, the uh, Rahmatullah or we obstruct Rahmatullah, that automatically results in evil or is evil a separate active cause in itself so that Allah not only dissipates the, the delusions of human beings, but also dissipates and ends what was manufactured and produced as an affirmative act by shaitan, by the demonic forces. 
it's a long philosophical debate. We, 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 you know, I belong to the first school that believes that without you know going great length of, on it about it that it is the absence of a Rahman in anything that generates and produces evil, and that w w the way evil is created is to actively block the manifestations of Rahman, which are by, by the very nature of things, Allah manifests constantly in our existence. I mean, absence of a Rahman or absence of God? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, my short answer, because you take me to... Then we'll not I know, finish I mean, the sort of, you yeah. were avoiding yeah. the... the yeah, the, I know. I'm, I, I'm, 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 yeah, I was hoping no one would notice, but of course you did. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's absence of a Rahman, the, the uh, short answer. Yeah. The absence of a Rahman. And, but the, 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 the question, as you can tell I me, mean, in the field of theology, these are the things that we, uh, we, we talk about at great lengths because they do make a difference. And they do make a difference, especially when you are dealing with the people of philosophy and you're responding to, the, to philosophical arguments. For the, for the abid, for the regular human being who just wants to worship Allah, I don't think that taking them into these journeys is essential to their, to their iman. I mean, it, it is sufficient for most people to know that Allah's attribute that never separates and, and never becomes separate and apart from Allah is that Allah is Rahman, a Rahman and a Rahim. You know, whether that is by, by, by Asma or Safat and, you know, is the debate we, you know, We'll sidestep for that. Okay, now notice here, uh, just uh, um, notice in the in the Quranic expression, and Quran is always very accurate in the way that it it, it uses language. Um, it says, "Kullu man alayha fan." Okay, so wa yabqa wajhu rabbika. Do and Jalali wa Ikram. Wajhu Rabbika, the face of your Lord. Here it didn't say Wajhu Rabbikuma. Notice that while it says Fabi Ayi Alai Rabbikuma to Kaziban, so in using the dual form, the two of you or the both of you, here it breaks away from that usage. And when it says what will remain on, on, on this earth as a solid reality, it doesn't say use the dual form and use the, uses the singular form. And the reason for this is, is quite I mean, interesting if, if you get into how accurately the Quran uses language. Um, Because when we talk about the ultimate truth, not a matter of belief, when we talk about the reality of things, we, Rabbika, meaning to each of you, the, to each of you, the only truth that is recognizable is the truth of your Lord. But when it talks about takzib and iman, when it talks about whether a matter of belief, whether you deny your Lord or believe in your Lord, it is talking about a matter that involves choice. And so here it uses the dual form, whether it's talking to, if we accept that it's talking to humans and jinn, so it's saying, what do you humans, and how do you jinn, how can you choose to not believe in your Lord? Each has a message and each has a choice. And that's why it uses the dual form for Rabbikuma. 
But when it talks about the reality of what remains at that final moment, when the illusions of existence are removed, the, the, you pull out the curtain and you see the only ultimate and absolute and unwavering truth, it says the singular form. Because here there's not a matter of subjective belief anymore. There's, not, there's no choice in it anymore. There's another, as a, uh, um, uh, another thing that commentators always note that it didn't say as for instance you find uh, for instance find in the Old and New Testament quite often the usage is Rabb, not Rabbika, not the the kaf. Um, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, 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 this is because of the the intimate the, the indicating. Like if it said it's as if the, the Lord that is not intimately aware and knowledgeable of you as your Lord in a personal form. This is a, a, a difference between that you often find between the Bible and the Quran. The, the, the Quran often uses the intimate form of a Rabb to convey to you the reality that this is a not just the Lord that is as an objective and absolute truth, but this Lord is intimately involved with you as a created being, intimately aware of everything about you and not standing as a distance from you. If you use a rub, that implies an emotional distance and also an epistemological difference, distance between the creator and the created. Just an interesting note. Okay, so then after the, the, the deceptions or the, the the self-disclosures of the divine, the divine through the created, through creation is removed, and we see the ultimate truth for what it is, and the ultimate truth is Allah, is a Rahman. Then it's it's before it starts addressing what happens in the hereafter are these fascinating verses. Yes, man fi samawati wal ard kullu yawmin huwa fi sha'n. Or fi sha'n. What is my English translation? Uh, what did I do? No. It helps when I, I don't have to think about the translation, I just read the translation. This one? Yeah, uh, um, is it the, So here he translates this, of Allah seeks its need every creature in the heavens and on earth, every day in new splendor does he shine. Interesting translation. This is Yusuf Ali. Uh, does anyone have any other translation? I'm just curious if, if uh, everyone what, translates what it. What verse is it? What verse? 29. This one is, which ten of your sustainer's powers can you disavow? That's Muhammad Hassan. No, um, tw 29 should be, what's the one after that? Third. Surah afterward? Yeah, the surah, I mean the verse right after that. Is ask, um, on him depends all creatures in the heavens on, on earth, and every day he manifests himself in yet another wondrous way. Mm -hmm. It's very close to Yusuf Ali. 
what I have yeah. says, uh, whoever is within the heavens and earth, ask him. Every day he is bringing about a matter. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 all the translations are within the the umbrella of legitimate meanings. Um, and it, it's... Uh, this verse, there's quite a bit written about it, and I was again reading some more of Sears last night. I mean, I was, Don Sharif is, uh, uh, you don't ever seem to reach a level, a level of saturation. It, it's literally endless. You can keep. Um, okay, anyway. Um, so, what is the, the issues here? Yes, I'm a woman for Samawati on Ard. So, those in the skies and the earth, ask him. It doesn't tell you ask him what, or ask him in what context, or whether it is implore him, plead with him, uh, whether there is a causal connection between the fact that those in the heavens and in the earth ask him. And then the continuation of the, of the verse, Kullu yawmin huwa fi shan, that every day huwa fi shan. Huwa fi shan could have several possible meanings that could be related to the fact that everyone in the heavens and the earth are imploring the Lord, or it could be completely a separate issue. Why? One possible understanding is that Whoever is in the heavens and the earth, ask him. And because whoever in, in the heavens and the earth, ask him, Allah is constantly responding to these prayers. And therefore, Allah is dealing with a different issue every day. Right? So, on this understanding, huwa fi shan means that he is engaged with a different matter in direct response to the prayers uttered by the created. Now, what is the problem with this understanding? Not that it's wrong, because the Quran always can have layers of meaning. Is what does kullu yawmin huwa fi shan? What is iyaw? Uh, in our language, it's a day, but does it is it referring to Allah's days or to our days? And does this mean that Allah is engaged? And as, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that it's our days, that Allah is responding to our prayers by manufacturing fate or is and, 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 or is the fate already decided and hua fishan means something else so is the the the, the vast majority of the mu'tazim that said no indeed Allah's unfolding of fate is in creation and contingent to the decisions of his creative, your decisions, and also your prayers. So you could have, it's not, it could be that it is not your destiny to go to Princeton, but you prayed and Allah decided that you're going to go to Princeton. Many of the Ash'aris and Asha'ir had a very big problem with this. Because he did not want to accept that Allah could be actually engaged, because for one thing, it, 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 in their view, it posed the problem as to Allah's foreknowledge. Allah is supposed to have foreknowledge as to your fate, by, according to Asha'ir, until your death what exactly is going to happen to you and what, what will entirely unfold. So if 
Allah has not yet decided and decides in response to your prayers, then how can Allah have foreknowledge? Now, the Mu'tazila has response to this. It said, well, what's the problem? Something hasn't been created yet. There's nothing to know. The Asha'ira responded to this. Well, it's problematic because Allah says that Allah knows everything there is to know about you. And knowing someone's future is necessary for the absoluteness of divine knowledge. Now, what there's another issue that you find in, in a lot of books of Tafsir. When they talk about Shan, is here, is that a Shan in the sense of a Shughl? So does Allah become busy with something and does this then imply that um, a, a form of tashseem or a form of attributing human qualities to Allah, that Allah mm -hmm. is engaged in a different affair. Now, what is quite um, the, the response there's no easy response to these issues, but I'll tell you what um, what the 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 tafsir that is closer to to my understanding of of it is that it, indeed who are in the heavens and in the earth implore him. and that the, imp, the but the imploring notice that he the, the verse about the end of life the, the and the comes first, and that only the reality of Allah remains, comes first before <coughs> telling us that Allah kulla yawmin huwa fi shan. Now, yawm here doesn't necessarily mean a day. Yawm could mean a period of time. In Arabic usage, yawm could be a day, or it could be just simply an unspecified period of time. And Shan is an indication of the one reality as absolute as the reality of a Rahman and God's self. And that is the constant, the, the reality of constant change. That we think that Creation ends with the end of earth. And I think there is no reason to think that. Uh, Allah will continue. This is a, this is a Rahman al Khalaq. It is all we need to know is that our presence on the theater, this period, is over. The curtains draw. And a new phase begins. Now, we, we are told about this new phase, about heaven and hell. But it, what is beyond that? It is beyond us. It's not beyond Allah, but it's beyond us. Now, yes, al samawat by the way, yes, and here, does not necessarily mean entreat. Yes, and could also mean, in Arabic usage, dependency that so for in, for instance what do the angels entreat the angels praise Allah for samawat the angels are in samawat but so and this is why it's something that you'll find it commented on quite a bit on the tafsir so we know that the angels have no needs and pray for no needs but yet, when we describe the relationship of angels to Allah, we use, yes, Allah malaik, or tas'al malaik Allah. Here, a su'l could mean simply praise or, in, or supplicate. That's a form of su'l. So, 
in Ibn Kathir and a lot of the tafsir that, um, that have become popularized, the way that this verse is understood is, well, don't think about predestination, only understand that Allah is constantly answering prayers. And I don't have a problem with this tafsir, by the way. I mean, that's a level of understanding. That Allah's, and we cannot deny that Allah is constantly answering prayers. Yeah. Otherwise, we would not be praying. We, we are constantly asking Allah for things. But beyond that, we also must understand Does it necessarily mean that Allah becomes busy with what we ask Him to do. That, that's beneath Allah. Allah is, is too great for, for to become engaged and busy with, with answering prayers. Fishad connotes a continuous act, a, a, a dynamic act of creation. I actually noted down, I'm trying to um, um, the I, I found a, a language and I, I noted down and I can't find it now. But here it says uh, splendor, splendor. Though I mean, it, 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 a lot of the the especially Ahmed Asad and the uh, the the study Quran. Uh, the uh, study Quran has a nice note about that it should be understood as Allah never stops manifesting. Yeah. And, and that, that goes with Du Jalali wal Ikram because the Jalal is that Allah's splendor never stops manifesting. And that's what Shan means. Okay. Um, let me just quickly see if I forgot anything I, I want to say about this. Is it possible that since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not contained in time or place or area, that since he's saying it's in accordance to our understanding of day and time, that we see the manifest of Allah in our um, dealings and you know what happens to you versus what happens here and there yeah, and it, so it's, on. It's one level of understanding. Uh, I would, so for instance, uh, um, this is one level of understanding and I would say that it, it is an understanding adequate if you do not need to think beyond that. Mm -hmm. But let me read you for instance what uh, for another layer of understanding so here the commentary the next layer of understanding is that while Shan, we could understand it as a manifestation in our earthly, but when we think about the nature of Allah, that there is not constrained in His true nature, in Allah's true nature. We might see the splendor of Allah as manifesting in different ways in our life, but if you want once your understanding of Allah elevates or the, the, the veil of material existence is lifted, you realize that Sha'anullah, the, the, uh, the, 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 the um, state of Allah is beyond our understanding, is beyond our comprehension. And so, and this way, we accommodate those who reach a point in their ibadah, in their in their point of 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 coming close to Allah, to of transcending subjective, relative, material existence, 
And uh, so, for instance, when when uh, Al Sufiya uh, uh, get to a point of uh, in in their worship of Allah and their understanding of Allah that that Allah is uh, that all these manifestations that we see are so partial and so uh, uh, limited in relation to the truth of Allah that it becomes a, a, they, they reflect upon the essence of Allah in Allah's true self then they see that sha'an cannot be understood in a physically limited spatial sense they, am I getting through? So, and I don't think they exclude each other I don't think that these meanings, it's either this or that. It's like, and Surah Rahman, the entire Surah is structured this way. It's like layers of understanding. And there are possible layers beyond this that, frankly, I mean, so I, when I read Ibn Arabi, for instance, in his discussion on this verse, Kulli Yawmin Huwa Fisha, I don't fully understand what he's saying. It's beyond me. But and I accept that because my understanding has reached a point, but there are layers of understanding that are possible that are beyond us. What is dangerous is when we insist that the Quran is limited to this understanding and cannot be beyond it. And, and then th that, I think, is problematic because we, 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 we assume that al mukashaf or tajalliyat of human beings, the ability of human beings to comprehend the self-disclosures of the divine are all one and the same, and they're not. People are at different levels and different degrees. And that's the way Allah created them, and no one should covet what the other has, because each is special in its, in its way. Unless someone wants to ask something really necessary, I want to move on. Okay? Okay, so... I can because, ask later. Huh? I can ask my question later. Okay. All right, so... فَبِي أَيْ أَنَا أَيْ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَا زِبَانِ Now, this is uh, another thing we'll pause at. سَنَفْرُغُ لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الثَّقَلَانِ فبي أي آلاء ربكما تكذبان يا معشر الجن والإنس إن استطعتم أن تنفذوا من أقطار السماوات والأرض فانفذوا لا تنفذون إلا بسلطان. Where's my translation? Okay, so first the the uh, so first سنفرغ لكم أيها الثقلان the translation soon we settle your affairs O both you worlds. Now, what is, what is the issue with this, just accepting that translation on its face? سَنَفْرُغُ لَكُمْ Literally, that a literal translation would be what? We will, uh, we will dedicate or we will uh, focus or we will al farag in in our common Arabic usage is when you become empty or become at leisure or when you're done with something. So when I say saafrigu lihada, maudua means I will focus on it. I will concentrate. I will renounce my other responsibilities. I will let go of my other duties to focus on this, right? That's normally how we, in, in common Arabic usage, we, we use kilmet rah. But as they say in, in Kutub al or even you find it in the Sal al Arab, al Farag fil Lugha Durbain, Ahaduma, al Farag min al Shughl, wal Akhar al Qasdu il al Shayb. So, Farag in or al Farag in Arabic can be of two types. The first is that you, you dedicate your work or you focus your work on something. The other meaning which in common Arabic usage today is not commonly used as, but in Arabic poetry you find it 
in ample usage. أقصد إلى الشيء. وتا أفرغ لهذا means I will focus on something. It's not that I focus doesn't necessarily mean that you will let go of other responsibilities to do something, but simply that you you're, you're, you will focus on it. You will dedicate yourself to it. So when Allah tells us that سَنَفْرُغُ لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الثَّقَلَانِ It doesn't mean that Allah, uh, uh, as they would say, لا يَشْغُلُهُ شَيْءٌ شيء. That Allah does not need to be relieved of something in order to carry the obligation or the duty to do something. This is, by the way, quite, con quite opposite the biblical notion of Allah resting. Right? Allah working six days and resting one. In Islam, the idea of Allah needing to rest or need to be relieved of something, to focus on something, is unacceptable. So, that's why, you know, you, you just be um, careful in when we, we say we, we, shall, we shall settle your affairs that's closer to the meaning of cost or we will focus or we will we will resolve something so so sanafrugunakum doesn't mean we will uh, uh, dedicate in the sense of we will be relieved of some obligation to carry another obligation but rather this matter is going to be settled this matter is going to be dealt with and what is the matter that is going to be dealt with is the two weighty issues. Now, what are the two weighty issues? And here is some very fascinating discussions. Most said that the, the beginning or number one meaning of it is that the accountability of humans and jinn. الثقلان, now, why were they described as الثقلان? I'm sorry? The well, it, 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 the not thiqal in the te, in the sense that they are weighty upon God, or heavy upon God, but weighty upon balancing the good and evil deeds in the mizan in in between the weight, or as the, a whole school of thoughts insists that. If human beings and jinn did not commit sins, لَمَا كَانَ عَلَيْهُمْ ثِقَلْ That they would, they would not be weighty. So it is, why are they weighty? It's by the sins that human beings and jinn continue to acquire. Now, I said that's one meaning, and that's the, the most often encountered meaning. The, some, because... Uh, um, whether it's, whether it's a true attribution to Abu Hanifa, some Muslims believe that it is improper for us to think or to talk about the process of accountability for jinn. I'll even tell you that some believe that jinn don't have an accountability like human beings. That jinn... I, I, I hesitate because I don't want to open this door whether... It, 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 Reportedly, Abu Hanifa said, and many Hanafi scholars, especially Mataridi, said that the jinn do not have an accountability similar to human beings. They are, because they, they are created with a greater orientation towards evil than good, their heaven and hell is very different, and their system of accountability is very different. So, Thakalan cannot be referring to the accountability of the jinn. I, I'm not, I don't know if I agree with that, and, and I don't ask me questions because then it will open a door that will not be able to close. Why did Abu Hanifa, did Abu Hanifa say that? Well, what type of accountability? Do they have heaven and hell like us? Is it, you know, an ocean? If, if you know, maybe when you were old and senile and you've 
we've gone through the entire Quran and you want more and more and more, we can, you know, probably I wouldn't be alive by then, but we can get into that. But nevertheless, some have said that the Quran it, here doesn't refer to just to the accountability of, and this is what I believe, is that it doesn't just refer to the accountability of humans and jinn, but it also refers to the nature of good and bad itself. That the biggest disclosure that you will ultimately be confronted with in the hereafter is the realization, and, and for a level of people, that confrontation and that realization is critical because only through that confrontation do they can make sense of their existence is confronting the nature of good and bad to see the truth of things. So thakalan here means the, the weighty matter of like in absolute and perfect understanding of what is hasan and what is qabih, what is good and what is bad. So Imam Jilani, for instance, says that it would be unjust of Allah to deny a class of people whose live and die with the unending passion to know the truth of good and bad, to deny them of that, that understanding. Because that understanding is more important to them than anything else. There, a lot, there is, you can, there's a lot of beautiful things written on that. Uh, and, and they're quite beautiful because when um, they, they start going through how the world thakal was used in Arabic poetry and how the usage of the Quran of that word in this place is intimately tied to notions of morality. It's very beautiful talk. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that you can really sink your teeth into as I was doing last night and then I decided it's just, it's not possible for me you know, I, I, it's not possible for me to, to go through it and, and still finish Surah Al-Rahman in any reasonable <laughs> fashion. Um, okay, so, now, this is a critical turning point in the verse. The, the end of existence, the truth of Allah, another truth that you then be confronted with, the, the nature of the accountability of humans and jinn, and also the most weighty matter that so often, as we said earlier, we live our lives drowning ourselves in deceptions, in the deception of money, the deception of family relations, the deceptions of love of property and ownership, the deceptions are the distractions, so that we avoid thinking about the thakalan. We avoid thinking about the weighty matters of the truth of good and the truth of evil. If you truly confront them, the distractions, the deceptions of playing video games that we talked about earlier, become, become near impossible. And in fact, as been pointed out by uh, many of the Mutasawwifa, it is Allah's mercy that you are able to distract yourself because if you completely become unable to distract yourself and only focus on the nature of good and evil, then you will not be able to have intimate relations with a spouse. You will not be able to raise your children, you will not be able to enjoy material yeah. things, it, it will become all-encompassing and all-engulfing. And that does happen, you know, among those who truly confront as uh, in, in, um, But 
being too distracted is a corruption of the Misa, of the balance. And that's where the vast majority are. It's listen, me, really. No, the vast majority are not obsessed with Sakalan to the point that they, you know, okay. cannot enjoy material things. It's quite the opposite. The vast majority take the Sakalan for granted. They, they take it for granted that, oh, Allah will forgive us. Allah is merciful. Allah, you know, they take uh, the 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 they make light of the fact that there is a very weighty issue here and the weighty issue of justice and fairness, and Allah cannot simply extend. And this is another layer of discussion that I'll, I'll just introduce now, but we'll carry on with later that it would be an unjust Lord to extend forgiveness to all people regardless of their deeds. Because then the, 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 the very meaning of dedication and sacrifice and commitment becomes thoroughly compromised. And so it is a thiqal, it is a very weighty matter what, what, what the, the nature of justice and truth and equity and beauty is. It is not simply a matter of forgiveness extended or mercy extended. It is a very serious and weighty matter. And the lies are those that realize that justice doesn't just involve dealing with them personally, but involves the implication of whatever treatment will be afforded to them, to others. So if I say Allah will forgive me, well, what is the implications for every similarly situated person? Should they be forgiven as well? How about those who are similarly situated to me, but sacrificed? <coughs> and dedicated themselves. What happens to the scales of justice? If you think about it, it gets to the point where your taqwa increases because you can no longer, no longer your piety increases because you can no longer take for granted that Allah will simply forgive you. You see, Allah can't, can't extend mercy to me without having implications for everyone else. That don't go too crazy with it because it could drive you crazy. Because then you could, on the other extreme, despair in the mercy of your Lord. But your Lord is most just and most merciful. And that is why it is a true thicken. Because us, a normal being, would crush under the weight of the implications of this. Well, how about the difference in historical circumstance? How, for instance, how about the implications of the technology? How about the implications of seduction? Does Allah treat someone who was born in Arabia, you know, in Mamluki, Egypt? How about the, you know, the implications of slave markets? You could, you could truly look and the, oh, you need an all-knowing, divine, absolute, absolute Lord to deal with this heavy scale of justice that you're promised. Because every other intellect, regardless of how complete, will, be, will, come, will crumble under the weight of the implications of it. And that is why I, I and, and Ibn, a lot of people think Ibn Rushd was a pure, uh, um, rationalist, and, and he was not. I used to read, in, in the good old days, I, when I, I used to uh, read texts, uh, offer a seminar reading Ibn Rush's writings. I was there. Yeah, you was there. I, I really, may Allah bring these days back because I, I just need the, the energy and health to just mm -hmm. do it again because they, these I, I enjoyed so much. Um, the, even it says some very nice things that regardless, you know, our use, we are encouraged to to compete in understanding the nature and the scales of justice through reason. 
But ultimately, it must be fully aware that perfect justice and ultimate justice cannot be contingent on a created reason. Needs the absolute. Because without the absolute, it is impossible. And that's where he, by the way, disagrees with a lot of the Platonic thinkers and, and, and Neoplatonists and so on, that, that the idea of, a, of reason as, the, as a perfect judge of, you know, in a, in a Kantian sense of, of justice. Okay, enough said about this? Let me move on. The feeling I have when he says also it's because of all what you just said, all this heaviness and our incapacity of reaching something that we are going to free you for, to the lightness of being. You know, otherwise you'll be all the time in feeling guilty, in feeling uh, suspicious, in it's, feeling it is doubting. Not, uh, not, not no? here, not here. The, the, uh, Allah, not. San Mufrihu, but is Sanofru. Rabbina Hefra. Rabbina Sanofru is Lakum, Sanofru, Lakum, and you are Sakalan. So here, who, who is going to be engaged in the act of Farah? Rabbin. Allah, yeah. right? Yeah. And engage Bimana Kost. The yeah. shape, the, the, the meaning of the, 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 that we will focus on or we will um, aim. aim at the, the, with, with the uh, a dedication towards, right? D towards what? what? Not Ifrag al Not Ifrag al we will become focused on you and you are the Quran. It's, it's not we're going to empty you. It's not some Not really, sorry. Yeah, we're not, we're not emptying anything. Not empty, yeah. yeah. But we, we are becoming dedicated to something. We, we, it is, it is, as, as a, a nice way of, uh, um, I forgot who wrote it this way, but it said, it's as if it's a promise from Allah that Allah will resolve yeah. the most weighty of matters. Yeah, that's how you feel. So it, it is not that Allah will relieve us of, of the weighty yeah. matters, but it's a promise. It's like saying, rest assured. Mm -hmm. No, rest assured that these very weighty matters that you might have resolved an entire existence thinking about the weighty matters of the scales of justice, of al mizan, of it. Well, it is a promise that Allah will completely resolve it or deal with it, whether deal with it in terms of resolve it or adjudicate it or uh, uh, pass judgment on it. That's all. Po these are all possible meanings, but it is not. It, it, it would not be accurate to say that. Don't worry about it. There is no connotation of don't worry about. It. It's, a, it's simply a promise that, in fact, the implication is quite the opposite. That, you know, the the thakalan are quite important, and that's why Allah promises you that Allah is going to focus on them. So if you don't, if you don't think about them, we should, because they're they're critical for the mizan and they're critical for existence, and they're critical once this existence that the, the 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 veil is lifted, and the delusions of existence are lifted, and the truth of Allah is revealed, all that will remain other than wajallah dhu jalal wal ikram. All that will remain. Is the thakalan, is the the the, the scales of justice, and and then that is a critical passageway to what comes after that, which is what we describe as either heaven or hell. So, all right. Oh Lord.
I'm not going to finish Surah Al-Rahman today. <laughs> ya Allah. He said it could okay. take us a lifetime. The, the, the mistake, <laughs> the, the error is in me. I, I can't just, I, I, I can't no, just it's stop. I mean, it's like I, every time I, I, I remember I've read this, I've read this, I've read this, and then I can't just say, okay, just don't share it. And I... But that's the beauty of it. Otherwise, we can read the translation what, what, at home. Where's the hurry? That's the beauty of it. You know? Where's the hurry? You okay. Yeah, and why do you have okay. to finish so, it today? Okay. Don't as long as, 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 long as you... As long as I'm not boring you. No, that's the part <laughs> I, I personally, that's the part I'm enjoying. You know. I, I always worry that I, I well, Greece can t t testify to this. I always, I'm always convinced I, I, I'm boring, boring and I bore the people I talk to. Oh my God. And so I. I, I it doesn't just silence me in halakas or in classrooms. It also silences me at home. Because whenever I'm talking to, you, to my wife, I say, well, I'm boring you. I'm going to not do the same thing. And that's why she follows you around with, with five what did you say, she? tape recorders. <laughs> she does follow me around with tape recorders. Very weird. You have a very weird existence. I have a question. Okay. Um, I don't know. Um, go ahead. Know. We're going to we close. Shall we finish at five? I mean, it's yeah. seven. Seven. <laughs> I think we'll say seven thirty. It's one more minute. Okay. Seven. No, I mean, I can I can ask my question at the end of. No. Uh, okay. Go, go ahead. Now. Yeah. Uh, my question is thirty. Anyway, so yeah, this might no, be good to just. Yeah, because we we have to we have to leave to get back home. My my brother is coming to visit, so. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. uh, from out of there, he just he actually arrived in Meadows, so the one who. Uh, uh, Taking care of yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I, 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 I know that your questions are always, uh, 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 you know, uh, Amir is a alim in his own right. So, 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 uh, but I, so I'm, I want to. I'm, I'm interested in what the question is. So just uh, go sure, ahead. Sure. Whether I'll answer it or not. Is of course, of course. Yeah. How radical. Is this change from the moment that 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 the, the nature of uh, good and evil has not been determined or resolved, and after that, because that's that's when I, I don't want to use the word freeing human being from realizing how heavy it is to understand these the, the, the differences between good and evil mm -hmm. because you you said it doesn't mean re relieving human beings yeah. from yeah. but but it's it's a radical change it, it's, it, does it require I'm sorry that that might be yeah. what is the context changing this world to another world well or or so forth. I mean, I mean, I'll just, just see that it is so radical that, as we'll talk about in this, in, in, uh, in the coming uh, uh, the verses, that some have say, have, and and you'll see this in in, in as I go over uh, uh, what. A certain class of of of, of uh, said um, that the nature of heaven itself is to exist in a world of perfect knowledge or near perfect knowledge, depending on your state in heaven. So some said that. Those who lived deceived by material things, their reward in heaven will be material things, eating, drinking, um, copulating without, you know, whatever they... Uh, and and but the but the deception continues, because whether these material things actually have any any real existence or just another delusion, 
So, you know, you think you're eating an apple, but what is the true nature of, the, of, these, of what you think you're eating? Mm -hmm. That the, 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 the higher levels of hell, or, I'm sorry, of heaven, is to see things for the, the, their true nature. And the, that is what the Jannat are. It's not, and I'm actually, I'm going to, because it's modern Muslims, it's so unusual for them, thanks to the influence of the Wahhabi movement, that they never hear the, these, they never encounter these tafsirs. None of our madaris talked about any of these uh, tafsirs. We, we were all taught in our madaris, uh, the, the governmental run schools and so on, that, you know, it's all the materiality of heaven and hell in, in, the, in, the, in the physical sense. Uh, that I, I uh, Muslims are, it's so alien, modern, it's so alien to other modern Muslims that sometimes you just need to read the actual language to them so that they'll believe you that, that our ancestors actually had that level of understanding. But it, it, Allah gives us so many indicators that Allah's Allah's ability to continue creating is endless and boundless, and that the, just because the, Allah closes, as, as Allah describes, describes it as if he closes a book, Qayyus uh, Sohuf, uh, um, on one creation, what it, it what Allah replaces it with is limitless. And so that reality, we know that it will change. And Allah gives us many different hints about how radical the change is going to be. But it's the true nature of the change, you know, that, that's a very big issue. That's a very big question. Is, um, is it possible that uh, a change from space and time and place into everlasting thing, into the reality of Allah Azza wa Jal, where this is, we, we all live in a time-related um, place and space. And when that goes, there's nothing but existence of Allah Azza wa Jal. Say, say the universe is no longer here. We're, we're in an everlasting, state of what it is, we, we don't know. Well, this is, you know, this is, it brings about the, 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 the long, uh, we cannot know, we cannot know. We, our understanding of, of reason is so limited to time and space and to our experiences that as long as we are within the bounds of reason, we, we only dwell in the realm of the dimension of time and space and physical causal laws. Now, the big debate is whether knowledge beyond that, the only possible means for knowledge beyond that is through tajalli or mukashaf. In other words, that, that, that because you purify yourself so much that you become privy to an awareness that is not subject or does not work through the mechanisms of reason. But as we'll talk about Tajalli and Mukashafa, Tajalliyat, many people think that Tajalli, it's the self disclosure to one can be taught to another, and that's completely wrong. Tajalli, by its nature, the Allah's self disclosure to each human being is so personal and so specific that the tajalli, the self-disclosure of Allah to a human being is not transferable to another. So just because I received the tajalli in a certain way, 
it mm -hmm. at all does not mean that the person next to me will receive it in the same way. So when I relate, if I relate the, the, my experience with a tajalli, or write about it, or describe it, I must always warn that all you can take from it is my testimony for my personal experience that is not communicable to you. Uh, um, and and the, it, it's interesting because the surah itself you'll find, um, and I'm going to read to you the some of the of the descriptions of this. Um, when they they in in dealing with the way Allah describes a jinan in Surah Al-Rahman and and the uh, the way that at least a class of of Mufassirun understood this what what this to mean. <coughs> what time is it now? Um, I'm, I'm just trying to I want to stop at a, at a, at a convenient point so. Um, I, I'm just thinking of where that will be. Yeah, okay. Ya ma'asha rajal. So, فَبِأَيِّ أَلَاءِ رَبِّكُمْ وَتُكَذِبَرْ Notice here now, it, it, because we're moving to the world in which you still have the, 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 the choice to believe or not believe, but your ability to deny what you will be immersed in becomes more constrained, so that refrain will be repeated more and more and more frequently. Then the, this the, the, another ya ma'ashar al-jinn ni wal ins in istatatum an tanfuzu min aqtar al-samawati wal ard fanfuzu la tanfuzuna illa bi sultan. So clearly first it's talking to ins and jinn. I'll just easier to read the, the okay. Uh, Fifty-five. Thirty-three. Okay, so uh, all assembly of jinn and humans, if you can pass beyond the zones of the heavens and earth, pass. You will not be able to pass illa sultan without authority. Not without authority shall you be able to pass. That, so that's a literal translation. So young martial jinn, O people of the jinn are ins. So clearly here it's addressing the two types of creation, the jinn and the ins. In istatatum and tanfuzu min aqtar al-samawati wal ard fanfuzu la tanfuzuna illa bi sultan. So if you are able here, tanfuzu, nafaz al-shay, is normally means to pass through something, to, um, to, to pass with the connotation of usually exhausting it in the process. But the, now, when it tells us tanfuzu min aqtar al-samawati wal arm, is it saying? If you are able to escape the heavens and the earth, and when it's when the command or the tells us go ahead and try to escape, because remember that the verse that will come after this is a promise that if you try to escape. There are mechanisms that will prevent you from doing so. Because I mean, might as well. The I, I, I will get to the to, to to these verses. But as we think of the meaning of this one, we have to keep in mind the refrain that Allah told us. So is it talking about a physical escape? And what does "tanfuzu min aqtar al-samawat wal ard" mean? Is it one possible meaning is that it is saying if you are able to ask, escape judgment or try to do so, but then why say la tanfuzu illa sultan? So, which literally means you cannot do it without Allah's authority. 
So those who said it's a challenge to humans and jinn telling them you will not be able to escape final judgment and if you want, go ahead and try, you'll not be able to do it. The, what is the problem with that tafsir? The problem is if you if it's impossible to do it, then what do the countermeasures of having molten fire being thrown at you could mean? And what does well, you cannot do it except with Allah's authority when we know Allah's authority will not be extended to anyone so that they can escape judgment. It's, it's, we're talking about a, 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 some, an impossibility, something that is mustahil. So it would be no min al a form of, of nonsense for, for us to consider a possibility of escaping judgment it, when Allah's authority will not allow anyone to escape judgment. Okay, so some of the commentators said well what this so is not talking about judgment it's talking about that wherever you go, you will remain within Sultanullah, that you will remain within Allah's power of compulsion, that you might be able to break away from the seven uh, uh, heavens or Samawat al-Saba, which by the way was re quite remarkable for medieval scholars to 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 even entertain the possibility that someday human beings, I mean, although, of course, a lot of times they were, they, you're, it's not clear whether they were thinking just of jinn or possibly human beings, but they would say it is possible for created, the created, actually, some quote of it says humans as well, that humans and jinn would be able to break away from a, the stratosphere of Earth, which again, I mean, for very forward-looking. But wherever they go, one, they only do it with Allah's authority, but two, it, they're not going to be able to escape within Allah's ultimate kingdom and ultimate power. But, and again, that's an acceptable understanding it's an acceptable understanding, although less acceptable. My, it's a ch challenge to to Jin and Ins that listen. Whatever you do, you're not going to be able to escape Allah's judgment. It's an acceptable understanding to say whatever you do, wherever you go, you're not going to be able to escape Allah's power of compulsion and Allah's authority. There is Ibn Abbas of of the, of the early uh, uh, commentators of the Quran, Ibn Abbas um, articulated an opinion that I, uh, I think uh, a lot of commentators added to and, and one that I think comes at least is more convincing to me or the most acceptable and convincing to me. And it is rather surprising when you first read it and then you read the commentaries on what Ibn Abbas says, it strikes you and then you reflect on it. So he says, in an ma fi samawati la illa sultan. If you are able to learn, to have knowledge of what is in the heavens on earth, Go ahead, learn it. You cannot do so. Whatever you learn, it is because Allah allows you to learn it. Now, why, why would that surprise someone? Because what is, how did Ibn Abbas get the notion of ilm from Tanfuzu? Right? So, 
And uh, how how does he understand this verse when? And Ibn Abbas, the, the, the commentators on Ibn Abbas, because Ibn Abbas is what survived from Ibn Abbas, are very short statements, but the commentators elaborate whether out of, whether they're, they're de sort of deducting or they're, they're transmitting, it's beside the point, but anyway, they say, that to go through something, so, for instance, in Arabic we say nafiz al basira. Someone is very perceptive. We use the word nafaz because nafaz in 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 Arabic usage can also mean a to see through something, to comprehend through something. So. Building upon the opinions of Ibn Abbas is that when Allah is is challenging jinn and humans, Allah is challenging them by saying, "Go ahead," and here it relates to the notion of thakalam, because it is through knowledge that we study the nature of the two weighty matters of good and the opposite of good, of, of beauty and ugliness. And Allah is telling us, well, you know, you want to learn as much as you need to learn about the heavens and the earth. You will, Allah knows that you as human beings, you, the, the nature of human beings are argumentative. They're going to insist on learning and, and reflecting and speculating. And Allah is putting us on notice. Well, whatever you learn, no one for sure, that you learn it because Allah has permitted you to learn it. Whatever perception you have, don't ever think that this knowledge as the, perhaps I, I had a, I knew someone who went and got a doctorate in astronomy and upon studying astronomy became an atheist. And I always remember him when I think of this verse. That it's so possible for human beings to think that they learn and that their knowledge somehow is outside the purview of Allah. You wouldn't have the knowledge that you have and whatever knowledge you do have the, the true challenge to faith is when you start thinking that this knowledge has an, an has a an existence has a truth beyond its absolute contingency on Allah, and and this is by the way an important thing that we teach our children, because that's the nature of our modern existence is that they teach you. Constantly use in your intellect, use your reason, use your perceptions, separate and apart of its dependence on Allah. And it, in the the Quran is replete with these warnings that if you fall into that trap, you drift away from the mizan and you drift away from the rahman, and ultimately you you'll be. You know, as if a person possessed by shaitan, you lost. You don't know what's up or down. You don't. You're restless. You're you're dispossessed. You're, and and that describes to me so much of our reality. And and so, which now, and I'll I'll leave you on this cliffhanger because it is. That maybe that will convince people to come again. <laughs> <laughs> so no, notice immediately here, <laughs> here we immediately have the refrains as if saying, okay, if you are able to achieve nafaz, you, whether it is again first meaning, whether it is ever to, 
to escape Sultanullah, to escape the authority of your Lord, try it, you're not going to be able to do it because the authority of your Lord is all-encompassing, or whether you are able to learn anything, go ahead and learn it. You're not going to be able to learn anything without your Lord's permission and within your Lord's purview. Then you have the refrain immediately, and as many commentators say, every time the refrain is repeated is an indicator for you to stop and reflect upon the verse that has just been uttered by itself. Because a lot of people read Lat al Fuduna Idla Sultan and then continue on as if it doesn't have that intervening refrain to you will be chased by molten heat and so on. So it, it, they, they lump it together. What well, many of the commentators Note that if Allah would have wished these two verses not to have a refrain between them, Allah could have done so. Because that's the way the surah starts anyway. But in fact, the refrain is inviting you to stop with every ayah and to reflect on So how can you deny your Lord? How can you be in a state and as Jilani says, how can you be in a continuous state of self-delusion? And I, I, I like that because, that, as you put it, takzeeb law to, to deny your Lord is a delusion. And every time Allah then repeats the refrain, it's like saying, you know, you will be what starts out with Allah accommodating you because you're born as a little baby and you, you, Allah puts up with you as you grow up into maturity and so on and, and as you go on through the various tests and ups and downs and delusions of, of life on earth that reality especially as you approach death and after you die and your recreation it will become less and less deniable and that delusion will become shorter and shorter, short-lived, or less and more and more short-lived is a better expression. And if you are wise, you would reflect on this while you are still here and you have an opportunity to do something about it, rather than say, well, you know, that was true. just let, 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 us, let us wait until until it confronts you and it's undeniable and and Allah promises us that even till even we are even those and, and may Allah protect us and not make us among them even those who are in the midst of hell they will continue imploring their Lord for mercy so the begging Allah never stops or asking or supplicating Allah, whether you are Tas'alullah meaning you are doing tahmid and tasbih because you are enjoying the blessings of Allah or you are in distress because of punishment and you want your desires of Allah's mercy the su'lullah the, the, the imploring the Lord addressing the Lord never stops in both cases and in all cases and this is another thing to reflect on that it is not like we uh, our relationship with our Lord is continuous even afterwards but if we are smart we want it to be a relationship premised on being in good standing rather than being in miserable standing and hoping to fix things. That's simply, you know, I wish we, for me, when I, when I, when, when it doesn't matter how old I get, every time I, I, I remind myself of these very basic things, my, my skin crawls and 
you you start understanding the, the attitude of so many of the companions that Alan made where you know they're, they're promised you, you would think that they would be so assured of everything but they, they continuously would invest on their life in this earth and never simply take it for granted that they're in, 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 in that all is resolved in the final day so how about you me and, and, and my standing was Allah, but I wish we taught our children to think of the hereafter and life on earth in this way. Because there's a, a, a certain logic to it that the earlier you internalize it, the better. It, it, as you get older, it becomes harder to change your ways. Not, not impossible, but it just becomes harder. Uh, in, in every passing year, it gets harder. When, when you're young, you have a certain flexibility of imagination that you might be able to internalize us, but there is a difference in the way we teach our children about hell and heaven than the way that that the way that I am talking about it right now, or at least the way that I remind myself constantly of its reality and its inevitability and the, 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 the inescapable reality of death and rebirth, uh, you know, which is something you have to remind yourself, and, and you do you remind yourself constantly because our, our very nature is so prone to, to, to engage in, in, in self-deception. <laughs>
um, Maya to because they were not responding. They, they were not engaging in a narrative as part of a defeated civilization. Mm -hmm. They they were not they did not have the complex of colonialism. They did not have the complex of apologetics. They did not have the complex of uh, 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 genderification and and patriarchy. And they 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 were speaking as in in a free sense sort of uh, dealing in the way that a confident human being deals with epistemology when they are sure of themselves and full of confidence. And that's the thing, is that you, you, you read the predecessors to spark and inform your thinking. A lot of people think that, you, that, that it means a slavish adherence to the predecessors, and I don't think any of you notice a slavish adherence in the way I deal with it. it, it it's, it's an engagement. It's a, you know, some things you accept, some things you say, well, that's a possible meaning, but I prefer, you know, here's another. Yeah, it's a methodology, and and it's a methodology that I wish more and more Muslims would learn and repeat. Um, it's a methodology that I hope all my students pick up from me, and um, and 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 adopt as as. Uh, but of course, you know, the, the, it 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 requires a certain level of confidence and bravery and humility, a lot of humility. That you, you, ne you never rest, you never say, well, I, uh, yeah, okay, I've got it. I think they should ask the, the teachers of New Horizon uh, that teach Islamic studies to be part of your Holocaust. Uh, you, really? you raise a very sore issue. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Really? Because those are the ones that are really affecting the kids at an early age, more than you, or more than me, or anybody else. So I have um, sometimes difficulties understanding certain verses, the tafsir of certain verses, and I would think that there might be a conflict, and especially in regard to Muslims, Christians, and what's going on, you know, uh, in, in along those lines. For example, when the Quran says, وَلَمْ تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ But yet, in, in other places, it says, وَهَمَّ فَرِيقٌ أَنْ يُضِلُّوكُ In other words, every time the Quran addresses the Christians, they, it doesn't take them all as a saying. Yeah. They hate you or, or not hate you. Or, but except in this verse, but which is addressing specifically the Prophet ﷺ that says the, the Christians and the Jews will not be pleased with you unless you follow their approach, period. So why are we here? Why are we making lectures? Why are we dealing with trying to convince them otherwise? Or And why the Quran also says some of them are good, some of them they pray at night, and they stand up at night praying and crying. And, and so how do we interpret that verse that the, the Christians and the Jews cannot, don't, in other words, don't do anything, just sit, and because they're not going to be pleased with you anyway. Do, do you want to take other questions? Yeah, I have a question regarding first uh, 20, Nine about every day is manifesting in one verse way. So it's a very basic question. I think you mentioned that. Yes, um, um, God in Christianity or the Bible of God would work six days and take a break on the seventh. And then it's, uh, in this Quran, it seems like God's always busy creating something. So with this, in the Quranic concept, that's what else God would do in, in basic way of saying, is this always in busy state? Because no, I think that what, what is, uh, let, let's try to take other. Well, is there any, are there any other questions to... Okay. The, uh, no, the, the, um, what is, everyone agrees on is in the Quran, Allah doesn't rest. Allah doesn't need rest. The, the whole idea of rest 
is and 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 by the way, whether the 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 Injil in fact says Allah rested on the sixth day is is its own issue because remember that um, the 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 Bible was very first written in Hebrew and then translated to Latin and and there's very interesting work on uh, whether the, the, the Hebrew word for rest and whether the, it, the translation to, to rest is an accurate translation from Hebrew to Latin, then Latin to, to especially Latin to English. And so, I mean, it, it, that's, I guess, a separate issue, but, um, but so, I mean, with the, with the qualification that I wouldn't even concede that necessarily in Christianity that it should, it should be that Allah rests. What we say in, in Islamic theology is that it is irrelevant. The concept of rest is not relevant because it, it, it implies the need to relieve yourself of exertion, which is not relevant to Allah. Now, there is a very interesting discussion about whether Allah, whether creation itself needs the affirmative act of Allah constantly creating to exist, or whether Allah creates and sets the laws, and it's like, um, and, and the debate is this, some have argued that Allah recreates existence every instant by instant. And that's the way existence works. Now, this used to puzzle a lot of people until we learned about, um, uh, what are they called? What is it called? Um, um, Blanking out. Um, Qu oh yeah, quantum physics. So I, I remember there was someone who mentioned this, and we, there was a, 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 a we were actually talking about it at Princeton, and, and it was a Darcy's class. And then uh, there was a graduate student who was a physics major and was an undergraduate, and he went nuts because he had studied quantum physics. And, oh my God, you have no idea. It's really important to me. That makes it because apparently at, at a certain level, uh, uh, the logic of, of causation breaks down, and and so and, and and things don't move the way that they were that they things work at the micro level very differently than they do at the macro level. Now, so th there are. Those who said that Allah is constantly engaged in, in, in creation by constantly sustaining creation and without Allah constantly sustaining, like, like the God particle, without Allah constantly engaged, this creation would completely just fall, boom. The others argued that, and the evidence from both, I mean, would take us hours and hours, so I'm not going to go through it. But it the others said, no, it's not like that. Allah basically created creation, created the laws of nature, and then said, off you go. It's like winding a clock. Allah wound the clock, and the clock is ticking by itself, and Allah doesn't intervene unless there is a cause to intervene, Allah, unless someone prays very hard, and then Allah comes in and intervenes because of the prayer. Now each camp has their own evidence. I mean, so I'm, I'm, it, it is not like when we talk about the Wahhabis where I say, oh, the Wahhabis corrupted their son. Uh, neither of these camps corrupted anything because both of them have their very respectable arguments and what supports them and what doesn't support them. I myself, I've swung back and forth between these two camps in different times in my life. so. I, you know, the, I've studied this, read things that convinced me one way, and then convinced me the other way, and then convinced me one way, and then convinced me the other way. 
does it make it, I mean, I have to say that a lot of times the way I'm convinced one way or the other depends on, yeah, my, 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 my spiritual state. Because sometimes <laughs> I, 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 I feel that I'm all present in every sense, in every moment, holding everything up. And a lot of other times I drift away and I don't feel it. And, and then I justify it intellectually. So it's, that's the nature of human beings. But again, as, as, as Greece gave us a good example at the beginning, be honest with yourself and confront the truth. Uh, the truth. That, yeah, I mean, I justify intellectually what, what my, the defects of my spirit um, wants me to justify. Um, you think it's so, an effect? Uh, you know, it's a human. It's just a human struggle. Um, it pulls you down to go up again. You know, it, it, as long as the conscious is awake, and as yeah. long as it, yeah. it interrogates you, and... and the Latina Jeff had the Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the mm -hmm. uh, okay. But, so anyway, uh, but the, the, the thing about constant creation that I, I mentioned is that a class of, uh, of commentators said that uh, that it among the meanings that it imports is that Allah is the, the, the creation the the, the, the act of Allah creating will not stop, suddenly come to an end with the final judgment or the, the, the end of days. That in, in, there is no reason to believe that this is because um, if you, a lot of Muslims believed that once a hereafter is, comes, that's it. There's no more story to the, the, you go to heaven or you go to hell for a period of time or for how long it is, whether it's eternal or not is another debate. But that's it. There, there no further creation, no further hal come over. And there, there is a whole class of commentators that said that that's, there's no reason to believe that. That's the point I was making. But so does that answer the question? Because that, that's closer to the, the, the issue of, uh, that's, a, that's a very different issue, the issue of Muslims and, and what the Quran says about non-Muslims. What I'll say is that any apparent contradiction is, is resolved as you delve, and this is what I, I was telling what I was uh, talking about uh, last halakha is that any apparent contradiction, the more you delve into knowledge, and that's the value of halakhat al ilm that, that instead of dedicating 10 years reading about the, all the, the verses that talk about Christians and Jews, because in order to really understand what the Quran says about Christians and Jews in all the nuances and all the subtleties, you need to sit, study the matter for about 10 years in a, in a focused, concentrated fashion. What the, what the use, what the value of those who pursue knowledge and become specialized is to uh, uh, to, to do the process of tathkir, the, the process of dhikr. The, the, uh, that they, they become a reference source so that, in fact, and that's what the, the, a, a truly learned person can, through a series of classes, explain all the various nuances of what the Quran says about dealing with non-Muslims without and in fact, that's one of the easiest issues, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. I mean, what I consider much harder issues is things like the true nature of evil or good or the, 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 the ultimate uh, uh, destiny of, uh, of jinn. And, and these are the tough issues. But 
there are issues, Jadaliya issues, but issues like uh, it, it we our understanding of these things have been become quite skewed by the Wahhabi legacy, and that's my my big problem with them is that they have erased an accumulated legacy of knowledge uh, and replaced it with aqidat al wala wal bara, which made us forget an inherited tradition of learning. And then today, when people try to go beyond wala and bara and relearn the tradition that made the Islamic civilization the most tolerant civilization that humanity has ever seen, they 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 go they have a hard time because of what has been erased by Aqidat al al Bara, and that's why these verses pose a problem. It's not because these verses are problematic; it's because the the tradition of accumulated learning that became the basis for the survival of Jews among Muslims and even Duru's among Muslims and uh, it, 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 people not even connected to Ahlul Bayt in any way or form to sur their survival among Muslims for centuries, the basis of all this learning has been lost because of the Aqidat al al Bara. Part Aqidat al al Bara is the Wahhabi idea that you must denounce you must be only loyal to Muslims and that uh, Jews and Christians and everyone else uh, are denounced and outside God's mercy and you should not befriend them. But that creed became so f powerfully established that all the intellectual tradition that made Muslims not just tolerate Christians and Jews but People who had nothing to do with me being people of the book. I mean, uh, what's the name of the the, 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 the people in Iraq? Uh, the ISIS? Yazidis. Yazidis. The Yazidis. I mean, the, the, the Yazidis or the Duru's or, or the Alawis. And, I mean, how you, you think you needed a very powerful culture of toleration for these people to have not been massacred the way that Europe, for instance, or South America or Asia or the survival of human beings have a horrible record with tolerance. I mean, a, a, a tolerance is not, and one of the biggest contributions of the Islamic civilization was its introduction. There is a book, uh, a very good book called um, The Roots of Tolerance in Enlightenment England, because it talks about where the idea of tolerance came mm -hmm. for Locke. Before Locke, when he was arguing for tolerance, for convincing Christians to be tolerant, it was such a foreign idea that he was accused, the irony of it, he was accused of being a Muslim. Because wow. how could you think that you want to tolerate heathens? You must be a Muslim. <laughs> Only the disgusting Muslims do things like that. This was back in the 16th century. It, there is a lot to say, but it, it, it and a lot more that you can. It, 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 and there's so much that that has been written in scholarship about how tolerance moved from from Islamic theology to Western thought, and then the West turned around and accused Muslims eventually of not having it, but only in the concept of colonizing Muslim countries. Because it, it, you couldn't colonize people that you, you admitted tolerance to. I mean, you couldn't admit that they were tolerant. But then, that's why in, in Reasoning with God, I, I talk about the Wahhabis being the biggest gift to colonialism. Mm -hmm. Because they could point to the Wahhabis as living proof that Muslims are not tolerant. And that's exactly what they did. They, they hated the Ottomans because the Ottomans tended to be far more tolerant. Mm -hmm. Far more. And so the, the, the colonialism said the Ottomans were not really Muslims. The Wahhabis are really Muslims. By the way, we saw the same thing by the spokesman for the Israeli army who started telling us the Iranians are not really Muslims, but 
we should all remember the great teaching of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. I don't know if you saw that video. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it comes up and it's like, oh, I, he's talking to his dear Muslims. And he says, you know, please remember the teachings of the great reformer Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, who told you that the Shia are more dangerous than the Jews and Christians. I mean, the same legacies of colonialism over and over again, celebrating the, the intolerant creed and then at the same time blaming Muslims for the intolerance that they have celebrated once it takes hold. Uh, that, by, also, by the way, why Trump doesn't point the fingers at the Saudis. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he, he will close the door on the Muslims who wanted democracy from Egypt and from Syria and from Yemen. But Saudi Muslims, yeah. oh, they're real Islam. He'll befriend them, but he'll befriend them as his inferior. From, yeah. So he can look down at them, yeah. and so he can go to the Israelis and say, oh, the only democracy in the Middle East. Yeah. It, no, our tradition is much greater than that. And if we, if we must know that it is the only solution and savior for us is ilm. Not ilm, you cannot gain ilm from someone who lacks it, who doesn't have it. So when we turn to the, 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 the imams of our mosques and teachers of our mosques, oh, ilm knowledge, right? The, and who don't have it, they don't have it, and expect them to to educate, how? And that's why, you know, I lose my voice, keep begging Muslims to, to financially support real learning, because if we have a lot of young people that, with great potential, but they need to be supported, need to be supported. But, you know, I, 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 I know the Torah is waiting, so I'll close with this. You know, as, of course, I, I, you know, last halakha, you, you weren't here, but I kept going on and on about manuscripts. Yes. And, and you know, of course, I, my, my dream is that to get, you know, a millionaire that calls up and says, okay, you know, how much do you need? I will save all the manuscripts that you are worried about. Just give me a number. I'll write a check. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, uh, the, uh, that's, you know, uh, uh, hope springs eternal, right? So you can, I continue to dream of it, it will not, never happen. Really uh, yeah. don't see that. But of course, you know, it, it didn't happen. Uh, and I, uh, uh, the manuscript of the Sukhi is not around anymore. No, oh, it's sold. It's sold? Yeah, of course, every, you know, nothing waits for us. You, oh. you snooze, you lose. <laughs> It, Muslims have to be, you have to realize, you snooze, you lose. Allah doesn't, is not, doesn't give a break to those who don't respect their own tradition. It, it, you know, it, it, Allah will never change our status and make us a different human beings as long as we don't even honor the intellect and piety of our ancestors. Not be subjugated to them like slaves, like sitting, you know, in right. ibadah, that's haram too. But but honor learning and honor the the, the, the investment of knowledge and time, that's the nature of things. Okay, great news. Sad news. Sad news. <laughs> Don't say anything. No. Until, until further notice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.